Universitas Diponegoro, UNDIP, as one of the most favorite campuses in Indonesia, is located in Semarang, Central Java, Indonesia. Semarang, the capital and the largest city of Central Java, is known as a My City with slogan The Great Semarang. The city is famous for heritage building. It lies in the northern part of Central Java, and it is about an hour flight from Indonesia capital city, Jakarta. Located about 15 minutes from the downtown of Semarang City, Faculty of Economics and Business, Universitas Diponegoro, brings its vision to become a leading faculty of economics and business in the implementation of three pillars of higher education, both at the national and international levels, as well as rooted in the surrounding community. This faculty was established on March 14, 1960. Well, let's have a look inside. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hi everyone, my name is Professor Soeharno Mo, Dean of Economic and Business Faculty, Universitas Diponegoro. Warm greeting from Semarang, Central Java, Indonesia. Let me inform you a little bit about our faculty. Faculty of Economic and Business is one of the best in Indonesia. We are top five based on world university ranking by subject 2021 made by Time Higher Education. We also offer sport master and doctoral program in management, accounting, and economics. All these programs incorporate the values of local wisdom as part of its curricula. FAB UNIP also has a professional program known as Professional Accounting Program which was established in 2003. All these study programs have been accredited and awarded A category or outstanding category by the National Accreditation Agency for Higher Education, Republic of Indonesia. Internationally, FAB UNIP is accredited by the Alliance on Business Education and Scholarship for Tomorrow, a 21st century organization, ABS 21. With a well-designed curriculum, facilities, and resources, our faculty provides the students knowledge and skills to succeed in national and global business environment. We have so many partners in developing our faculty, such as governments, banking industries, private sector, and also other potential universities, especially from Europe, Asia, and Australia. Currently, we are increasing cooperation with other stakeholders to bring our faculty to be the best choice faculty in Indonesia. Besides its regular study programs, FAB UNDIP also offers International Undergraduate Program to students. The International Undergraduate Program, or IUP, is established to meet the demand of today's international competition. All courses in the International Undergraduate Program are delivered in English, and the curriculum is in part with the top business school standard. The IUP consists of three majors, International Business, Accounting, Economics, and Finance. During the study, students can test their classroom theories and get innovative network through internship, business class competition, career fairs, and students groups. All IUP students will also experience to become part of the global society through double degree, single degree, and international student exchange program. Double degree program allows students to obtain two undergraduate degrees from UNDIP and partner institution. Since the curriculum in IUP FAB UNDIP is set to the international standard, all credits obtained in UNDIP are transferable to the partner institution and universities worldwide. Partner universities, Sakshon University of Applied Sciences, the Netherlands, University de La Réunion, France, MBS Paris 13, France, University of Applied Sciences and Arts, Northwestern Switzerland, University of Sheffield, England, Curtin University, Australia, the University of Western Australia, the University of Queensland, Australia, University of Technology, Malaysia, University of Malaya, Malaysia, University of Bangsaan, Malaysia, Shiba University, Japan, Kagoshima University, Japan, Kanazawa University, Japan, Toyohashi University, Japan, Chungang University, Korea, Kangwon National University, Korea, Asia University, Taiwan, Tunghai University, Taiwan, and etc. 
the faculty has academic and non-academic facilities to support and optimize the potential of the students. The library, economics, business, and accounting laboratory, and Bloomberg Finance Laboratory are provided for students to help them learn further about their studies. Our faculty is also equipped with adequate facilities such as basement parking area, sport facilities, working space, and green space for students to study. Beside the activities inside the class, we also have activities outside the class. For example, singing or economic voice, sound and dance, theater, study clubs or capital market, English conversation, and so many others. That's some of the things that you can get. So, what are you waiting for? See you at the Faculty of Economics and Business, Universitas Diponegoro. Au revoir. Annyeong. Sayonara. Universitas Diponegoro, UNDIP, as one of the most favorite campuses in Indonesia, is located in Semarang, Central Java, Indonesia. Semarang, the capital and the largest city of Central Java, is known as a My City with slogan, The Great Semarang. The city is famous for heritage building. It lies in the northern part of Central Java, and it is about an hour flight from Indonesia capital city, Jakarta. Located about 15 minutes from the downtown of Semarang City, Faculty of Economics and Business, Universitas Diponegoro, brings its vision to become a leading faculty of economics and business in the implementation of three pillars of higher education, held at the national and international levels, as well as rooted in the surrounding community. This faculty was established on March 14, 1960. Well, let's have a look inside. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hi everyone, my name is Professor Soeharno Mo, Dean of Economic and Business Faculty, Universitas Diponegoro. Warm greeting from Semarang, Central Java, Indonesia. Let me inform you a little bit about our faculty. Faculty of Economic and Business is one of the best in Indonesia. We are top five based on world university ranking by subject 2021 made by Time Higher Education. We also offer sport master and doctoral program in management, accounting, and economics. All these programs incorporate the values of local wisdom as part of its curricula. FAB UNIP also has a professional program known as Professional Accounting Program which was established in 2003. All these study programs have been accredited and awarded A category or outstanding category by the National Accreditation Agency for Higher Education, Republic of Indonesia. Internationally, FAB UNIP is accredited by the Alliance on Business Education and Scholarship for Tomorrow, a 21st century organization, ABS 21. With a well-designed curriculum, facilities, and resources, our faculty provides the students knowledge and skills to succeed in national and global business environment. We have so many partners in developing our faculty, such as governments, banking industries, private sector, and also other potential universities, especially from Europe, Asia, and Australia. Currently, we are increasing cooperation with other stakeholders to bring our faculty to be the best choice faculty in Indonesia. Besides its regular study programs, FAB UNDIP also offers International Undergraduate Program to students. The International Undergraduate Program, or IUP, is established to meet the demand of today's international competition. All courses in the International Undergraduate Program are delivered in English, and the curriculum is in par with the top business school standard. The IUP consists of three majors, International Business, Accounting, economics and finance. During the study, students can test their classroom theories and get innovative network through internship, business guest competition, career fairs, and students groups. All IUP students will also experience to become parts of the global society through double degree, single degree, and international student exchange program. 
double degree program allows students to obtain two undergraduate degrees from UNDIP and partner institution. Since the curriculum in IUP FEB UNDIP is set to the international standard, all credits obtained in UNDIP are transferable to the partner institution and universities worldwide. Partner universities, Sakshon University of Applied Sciences, the Netherlands, University de La Réunion, France, MBS Paris 13, France, University of Applied Sciences and Arts, Northwestern Switzerland, University of Sheffield, England, Curtin University, Australia, the University of Western Australia, the University of Queensland, Australia, University Technology Malaysia, University of Malaya, Malaysia, University Kebangsaan Malaysia, Shiba University, Japan, Kagoshima University, Japan, Kanazawa University, Japan, Toyohashi University, Japan, Chungang University, Korea, Kangwon National University, Korea, Asia University, Taiwan, Tunghai University, Taiwan, and etc. The faculty has academic and non-academic facilities to support and optimize the potential of the students. The library, economics, business, and accounting laboratory, and Bloomberg Finance Laboratory are provided for students to help them learn further about their studies. Our faculty is also equipped with adequate facilities such as basement parking area, sport facilities, working space, and green space for students to study. Besides the activities inside the class, we also have activities outside the class. For example, singing or economic voice, someone dance, theater, study clubs or capital market, English conversation, and so many others. That's some of the things that you can get. So, what are you waiting for? See you at the Faculty of Economics and Business, Universitas Diponegoro. Au Annyeong, Senara. Universitas Diponegoro, UNDIP, as one of the most...
Respected audience, we cordially invite you to be seated at the respective seats as we will start the event in a few minutes. On this occasion, I would like to invite the Dean and the Vice Deans to take the reserved seats on the stage. Before we start the event today, we would like to express our sincere gratitude to the Excellency, Vice Rector for Research and Innovation Universitas Diponegoro, Professor Dr. Insinyur Ambarianto, MSc, Respectable, Dean of Faculty of Economics and Business Universitas Diponegoro, Professor Dr. Suharnomo, SA, MSc, Honorable, Professor Paul Chang, as the Director of Asia Competitiveness Institute, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore, the Vice Dean of Faculty of Economics and Business, Universitas Diponegoro, all lecturers, alumni, and staff of Faculty of Business, Universitas Diponegoro, respected audience, undergraduate and postgraduate students, ladies and gentlemen, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First of all, let's praise our God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most gracious, the most merciful, the creator and sustainer of the universe, so we can all attend and participate in this online event without any obstacles. Today, May the 4th, 2021, we proudly present guest lecture with the theme of Measuring Competitiveness in the Field of Human Resources Asia Competitiveness Institute approach, and this event is the part of series of events of the 61st Dis Natalis Faculty of Economics and Business, Universitas Diponegoro. As the first agenda of today's event, let's stand together to sing national anthem, Indonesia Raya. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, please stand up. Ladies and gentlemen, please sit down. 
Respected audience, before we move to the next agenda, please fill in the attendance form at the link that we have sent in the Zoom live chat column for the certificate creation purpose. Thank you. Let's me speak in Bahasa. Hadirin yang kami hormati, sebelum beranjak ke acara selanjutnya, kami persilahkan seluruh peserta untuk dapat mengisi daftar hadir acara pada link yang ada pada kolom Zoom live chat untuk keperluan pembuatan sertifikat kegiatan. Terima kasih. Next, I would like to invite the Dean of Faculty of Economics and Business Universitas Diponegoro for an opening speech to Professor Dr. Suharnomo S.A. M.S.E. Time is yours. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh Warm greeting to all of us Respected Vice Rector for Research and Innovation Universitas Diponegoro Distinguished keynote speakers Distinguished guest academician Students Ladies and gentlemen It is my privilege to welcome you to the guest lecture with them measuring competitiveness in the field of human resources, Asia Competitiveness Institute approach. This event is part of series of events for the 61st Dies Natalis of Faculty of Economic and Business Universitas Diponegoro. On behalf of the committee, we would like to welcome and thank you for present our Vice Rector for Research and Innovation of Universitas Diponegoro, Professor Dr. Insinyur Ambaryanto MSD, and all respected guests to fulfill our invitation. We are very pleased with the participant of our keynote speaker, Professor Paul Chong in this event. He is the director of Asia Competitiveness Institute, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore. We are very enthusiastic and interested in the topic of your talk, Professor. The knowledge that you will share will be very use useful for us. Also, I'm honored to witness the signing of the letter of intent between Faculty of Economic and Business, Universitas Diponegoro, and Asia Competitiveness Institute, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore, on enhancing knowledge on competitiveness in Asia. Under the agreement signed today, the two universities will cooperate in enhancing the knowledge of human resources of both parties based on the principle of mutual learning and respect. I look forward to watching the relationship between these two institutions grow and flourish over the coming years. Finally, I would like to convey my warm welcome to all distinguished guests and participants of this event. May we have a fruitful discussion and may we will gain new and valuable knowledge. Stay strong, stay safe, stay healthy, and enjoy your life. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Professor Dr. Suharnomo, S.A.M.S.E. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, move to the following agenda, that is online signing ceremony of letter of intent on enhancing knowledge on competitiveness in Asia between Asia Competitiveness Institute, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore, and Universitas Diponegoro, Indonesia. The signing representing Asia Competitiveness Institute, Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore, is Professor Paul Chung, 
and representing Universitas Diponegoro is Professor Dr. Suharnomo, SEMSE. To Professor Paul Chung and Professor Suharnomo, please welcome. And we cordially invite first and second vice dean to accompany on the signing ceremony. To Professor Paul Chung and Professor Dr. Suharnomo SAMSE, we cordially invite you to on online photo. Please kindly show the signed documents to camera features. So I proceed to sign. To Professor Paul Chung, you may sign the document, please. Thank you. And then please kindly show the signed documents to camera features. All right, thank you very much, Professor. Thus, the online signing ceremony between NUS and UNDI. Now, we would like to invite you to an online photo session. To our audience, please turn your camera on so our operator can capture all of us. Please wait for all the audience to be ready. Let me count. One, two, three. Put the smile on. All right, once more. One, two, three. Put the smile on. Thank you very much. Dean and the Vice Dean, please return to the respective seats. All right, before we move to the next agenda, the Dean and the Vice Dean, please return on the respected seats. Thank you. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, now we have come to the main part, the reason we are here for the guest lecture with Professor Paul Chung from National University of Singapore that will be opened and moderated by Dr. Jaka Aminata SAMA. Let me read a brief CV of the moderator today. Dr. Jaka Aminata is now as the coordinator of International Office of Faculty of Economics and Business, Universitas Diponegoro. He obtained his Master of Arts degree from Nagoya University, Japan in 2002 and doctorate degree from Sorbonne University, France in 2017. His core of expertise is energy economics and management, industry, international trade finance, and blockchain. Without any further ado, to Dr. Jaga Aminata, SAMA, time is yours. Well, okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, Professor Paul Chung. Good morning. So I think so from Singapore and Indonesia, there is no time difference, so I think only one hour. Okay, so today we have a wonderful meeting. Uh, the microphone. Uh, oh, sorry. I'm just the acting. Huh? The acting if your microphone is on. Oh, it's just just speaking closer. Okay, thank you. Okay. So, okay, once again, uh, good morning. 
So let me to introduce, so I will read the CV of Professor Paul Chung. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, professor uh, from Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy, National University of Singapore. Also uh, director of the United Nations Statistic Division in New York. So I think almost nine years from 2004 until 2012. Also as the chief uh, statistician of the government of Singapore from 91 until 2004 and also as the director of population planning unit from 1987 until 1994. And also Professor Paul Chung awarded by the Public Administration Medal, Gold Medal by Singapore government in 2001. So, Prof. Chung, uh, we have uh, 25 minutes for your lecture. Start from normally, uh, start from now till next uh, 25 minutes maximum. And we will have around 15 minutes for question and answer. So, we would like to remind for all participants that for the question, please write down on the meeting chat room. So I think it will be very easy for us to organize. Well, okay, uh, now uh, Professor Chung will give a lecture. Time is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. So I'm very happy to be here today uh, to participate in this particular event. Uh, I would have preferred to be there in person uh, to attend this meeting, but unfortunately it's not possible uh, for me to travel because of COVID-19. Uh, first of all, let me send my greetings to Professor Sohan Longmo. Uh, very nice to meet you again. And I wish uh, one day I could visit uh, your college, your, your faculty and uh, have a uh, discussion with you about further collaboration. So today, uh, let me first of all uh, just share screen and uh, let me just uh, make the adjustment. Uh, we are now all trying to get used to using Zoom and so some of us are still trying to pick up the skills of this. change the title a little bit uh, because I don't really want to focus too much on the competitiveness index and how we measure it is very boring. So I would like to broaden the topic a little bit uh, to focus on the human resource, economic competitiveness and regional development. So I will go through very quickly about how we do it and also at the end I will bring some examples from Singapore and so that we can have a comparative uh, perspective. The, but let me at this time also say a few words of congratulations uh, to the University of uh, Dipon Diboro, our 61st anniversary of the faculty. So I really look forward uh, one day to visit you and uh, maybe at your 62nd uh, anniversary. And so uh, I warmest congratulations and I understand that uh, it's a very, very well respected uh, faculty and I really look forward one day of visiting you and collaborating more uh, with you. Yeah. So, Okay, 
so let me just say a few words about skills and uh, this uh, what we call the talents and ecosystems uh, we understand of course the fact that you know the human resource is critical for uh, national development for eco de economic development but then this uh, human resource and the uh, embedded skill set have undergone a lot of changes particularly during this uh, what we call now the industrial revolution 4.0 and you can be hearing that automation, digitization, and still skill intensivity and are all and job mobility are all part and parcel of this uh, industrial revolution 4.0 of this new normal of a new economy. So the new opportunities will arise, they will come out, and there will be chances for advancement, but at the same time. The need to reskill and retrain on a large scale has increased. So these are the so-called most uh, received wisdom now. Everybody is talking about how do we deal with automation, digitization. How do we how do we increase the skill level of the population? How do we deal with this uh, new economy uh, bring, brought about by industrial revolution? So developing a country's human resource is key and developing a natural, digital ready workforce and nourishing a talent ecosystem is critical for economic advancement. So I'll mention briefly about this and later on I'll give you some example from Singapore, how do we do it. But before that, let me just go through this, our Asia assessing competitiveness in Indonesia our approach from ACI, the Asia Competitiveness Institute. We have been doing this for the past uh, 10 years. We launched this in 2012, and over time we have been doing quite a bit of this, and we have been running annual conferences for a long time, almost every year, but until we got stopped by COVID-19. But last year, even though during, because of the COVID-19, we couldn't travel, we have organized quite a number of webinars for with each and every provinces, share with them our results and discuss the development prospects between the employers, the government and the academics. The discussion has been very good and we are very happy that we were able to continue this dialogue despite very difficult circumstances. So why we focus on Indonesia's subnational economies? This is partly because there have been a lot of national studies and we want to complement national level rankings and we want to champion the Indonesia's diversity and also to facilitate research at the local developmental level. So this is how we approach it and turn out to be very successful. We are not only focusing in Indonesia, but our interest also in whole of ASEAN and Asia. So we are taking this approach to other regions as well. And our framework is very simple. We have four elements. One focusing on quality of life. The second focusing on finance, business and manpower. The third focusing on macroeconomic stability and finally focusing on government and institutional setting. This framework has been used for the past 12 years, 10 years. They are readily available in the publications, so we would welcome your comments. But I must add that the framework now, after 10 years, is a little bit dated. We have been thinking about how to bring it up to date. Just now I mentioned about this talent ecosystem. How do you bring a measure, a talent ecosystem, this kind of a concept into a competitiveness framework is quite difficult. So we are going through a lot of uh, thinking now on how to update this framework and I will be happy to hear your comments. So the data sources, we have uh, using about 70% of uh, secondary data and then another 30% or so uh, of primary data. But uh, we are now again uh, making some changes to this and uh, this would um, have some final ad minor adjustment. Mm -hmm. So human resource is a critical dimension in development, but during our competitiveness framework, we, they are embedded into two uh, conditions. 
and these are the one in in the two environments. One is in the environment two, financial, business, and manpower conditions, and the other one is in the quality of life and infrastructure development. So then the relevant indicators are embedded there. So uh, shown here, mostly they focusing on labor force participation rate, and employment rate, and productivity measures. And then uh, also focusing on human capital investment, schooling, enrollment rate, and the uh, teacher ratio. So as you can see that they are very basic uh, indicators, measuring the basic elements. Now how can we improve on this and then measuring higher level quality? So that is the issue uh, before us. But we can see that uh, coming back to Java, the, the central Java, the labor force participation rate compared with the national level is a little bit on the low side, but the trend is about the same. So probably reflecting your economic condition and, uh, and the overall labor productivity is also tracking similarly to the national line with a little bit of a, a gap there. And for adult literacy, it's about similar kind of a pattern tracking uh, the, the national line, but of course, this line, this chart shows that the uh, illiteracy rate has been declining, means there's more education. And then similarly, the net high school enrollment rate uh, uh, improving for the central Java, uh, closing to the national uh, level. So given this comparison between central Java and the national level, uh, we can see that the central Java's ranking would not be that far from the national level and so it should be probably ranked very high and this is indeed uh, the case. So for 2020, the overall ranking for Central Java is about is 3 and uh, with the and then uh, for the environment uh, uh, the, on the financial business and empowerment, manpower condition, the ranking is number three. And for the quality of life and infrastructure development, the ranking is six. So it's up there among all the... And if we look at a bit more detail in the analysis, so the, for the under the financial business and manpower condition, the strength is really in the labor force participation rate quite high and employment rate is much lower, but then the productivity is a little bit uh, lacking behind. And uh, for the, the other environment, quality of life environment, the strength is that the net school enrollment rate is doing well, but uh, the mean school or schooling and teachers, student teacher ratio are, are not as strong. But these, all these are relative speaking. Uh, Central Java is really on a high end, on an up, upper end of the of the ranking. So when we say that strength and weakness is really very relative speaking. So we did a simple sim, uh, simulation exercise. We selected all the indicators that Central Java seem to be not doing as good as the benchmark. And then uh, and we benchmark it to the highest level, to the best performer in Indonesia. And the result we get is that before simulation, uh, the overall ranking was three or the third uh, in the, all the provinces. After the simulation, it become number one. And uh, so, and then the rest, there are also uh, improvement. So it goes to show that uh, with some minor in adjustments uh, in the indicators, it's very likely that Central Java could well become the top performer among all the provinces. So these are the things that we have been doing and then uh, we have uh, released our report for the 2020 and, uh, and so the report is, has been out and is available on our website. Now I would like to just switch gear and talk a little bit about the, uh, how to deal with human resource as a development uh, pillar. And, uh, and in this regard, let's start with this uh, making Indonesia 4.0. 
and it is a report uh, in a roadmap uh, put up by the government in 2018. So I'm not too familiar with the Indonesian situation. I understand that this roadmap uh, is the guiding uh, now the guiding instrument for the development of human resource in Indonesia. It could be affected by the COVID, but I think the trend line is there and the efforts put in in making this uh, Indonesia making Indonesia 4.0 roadmap, uh, the spirit is still there. And so the roadmap actually is uh, trying to revitalize uh, Indonesia's industrial sector, harnessing the digital leap, and then uh, recognizing the fact that uh, the world's uh, fourth largest population is also the country's uh, asset. I think all these are very important uh, principles. And, uh, and we know that for Indonesia, uh, now what Indonesia is entering what we call a demographic bonus, a demographic dividend, because your population is uh, taking on uh, there's a decline in the younger share of the population, so uh, the burden of caring for the young has been reduced, and then uh, the population entering into very productive uh, age groups. So that is, uh, and at the same time, understand that the economy, the GDP has been growing very nicely until 2019. Of course, after 2019, because of COVID, all the countries in the world are affected. So how to make use of this uh, working age population and then making them productive uh, and then contributing to the economy uh, is key. So I understand that uh, in this, uh, the role of human resource uh, in making Indonesia 4.0, they focus both on the quantity and the quality as aspects. And then uh, in the quantity aspect is to maximize the percentage of economically active individuals uh, in the working age population, get them out to work. And then in doing so, you expand the safety nets, social safety net, and we reduce, uh, it's not elevating poverty, <laughs> eliminating poverty. And, uh, and the quality, quality part of it is to enhance the employment capabilities of those economically active, providing upskill opportunities and matching labor pool to uh, market needs. And so this is the funding allocation. Central Java is getting a big share of it. I'm not sure exactly how the funding allocation has come about given the COVID and uh, given the reality of uh, making the allocations, uh, whether this is still uh, progressing as planned, but this is very important and very interesting chart. The bulk of the money actually go into industrial value chain, value added creation, which requires a lot more skill set uh, than before. And, uh, and this is, uh, uh, I think, uh, the right focus. Uh, but I'm not aware of what the exactly is now the funding uh, situation. But I do know that uh, in Central Java, you are following similar kind of uh, demographic patterns, but the GDP recently has been declining, partly because of the COVID-19 uh, situation. So I am not sure what is currently the situation, and, uh, but I understand that Central Java, a lot of it is actually uh, in uh, service, tertiary uh, industry, we were also a, a, a large chunk of it in the second, in the primary and secondary uh, uh, industry. So uh, this, in, and this reflects to the, the fact that there's a lot of uh, self-employed own account workers uh, in Central Java. And this own account, uh, um, a workers uh, interesting group because uh, they could be farmers but then they could be entrepreneurs uh, they could be running their own business so how do you bring the skill set to the own account um, workers is uh, a, a very interesting problem I think in most of the countries injecting human capital investment into the own, own account workers have been the most difficult and then I think the employees are the easiest to be trained. You can push them through. You can force them to take courses. You can elevate the job. We design the job and require certain skill sets. And so, but it was interesting to see how we can 
it's all how we can we bring the skill level up from these uh, own account uh, workers. So the, uh, uh, I was told that there are a couple of interesting uh, experiments uh, in Central Java. Uh, the first case is this uh, pre-employment programs, Katu uh, Pakaraja, uh, and then basically um, tr tr uh, training, providing them with a lot of training and, uh, and uh, providing them with some support. So the number has been quite big uh, in terms of 1 million over, close to 2 million successful registrants and, and all that. So maybe uh, the later on in the discussion, uh, you can enlighten me on whether this program has been successful and, uh, and the, the impact of this program. And the second case study is the fact that, again, they're bringing in uh, the digitization, providing basic internet access, uh, improving literacy, and then uh, and uh, providing uh, participants uh, to attend funding uh, to attend um, training to deepen their technological uh, knowledge. So, and then this is linked to the digital economy. So I can see all these uh, initiatives coming about and then, uh, and I'm quite sure that uh, once the COVID is over, when the training can go full force again, and then uh, there will be a rapid, very rapid uh, um, uh, improvement. Uh, in all this. So the COVID impact is significant and, uh, and it's very difficult and, uh, and particularly in terms of uh, investing in human resource and providing the skill training and uh, bringing everybody up to par. So it's very hard to train somebody when the person is not, uh, when you are not able to conduct in-person classes. In, my, in, in the National University of Singapore, Recently, we have a few um, um, a few clusters. So with some more cases with the COVID infections. So now all of us are working from home again. And then uh, and good thing is that the semester just finished. And so the student, the teaching is not uh, affected. But I was teaching um, for one semester using Zoom. And it, they have difficulties uh, in really uh, engaging the students to the Zoom uh, environment. So all this training will be a little bit complicated. I think the, the, the momentum will really be start again after the COVID and then so the pushing for all this uh, training for the digital economy, skill upgrading and all the other grassroots activities may have to be, uh, you know, uh, wait until the COVID uh, is done. So I would now shift gear a little bit to share with you the Singapore example. How do we, um, what are the experience that we have uh, in uh, improving our human resource, uh, injecting skills in the working population, and then creating this uh, talents uh, ecosystem. And that's an example. Singapore is very different from Indonesia, and very different from Central Java. Singapore is a city and uh, much easier for us to do certain things. And our economy uh, is purely uh, secondary and tertiary uh, sector. So uh, the context is a little bit different, but I would just like to share the Singapore approach to as, a, as, a, as an example. First of all, the, in our model of development, uh, we put a lot of emphasis in uh, developing and harnessing talent. As you will know that Singapore is not like Indonesia, we hardly have any resource. So we, the only resource we have is our population. And, uh, and even our population is not enough, we have to bring in a lot from outside. And so there are a lot of challenges for us moving forward to develop Singapore uh, in managing the human resource uh, component. But in our case, uh, we put a lot of emphasis in education. Primary education is free, compulsory, uh, diversity in the university education. We have quite a lot of universities uh, for such a small city. We are attracting a lot of foreign talent. And then uh, we also complement the local workforce with uh, foreign workers, as well as uh, special uh, talented uh, entrepreneurs. So let me just give you some, a bit of elaboration. So Singapore, uh, the government uh, put a lot of money in education. So 
every year we put about 12 billion uh, into our educational sector and uh and and people say that wow national university of singapore is number one rank uh, in asia uh, most of the years we are a lot of competitors but we are still uh, trying to get there or stay there but nus is able to achieve that status is because of the huge investment uh, in uh, educational sector. The government pumped a lot of money in, in attracting top professors and also in putting a lot of money in research and development. Very, very easy for researchers to get money to do research uh, in Singapore. And all this because the government put a lot of money there. And then you can see also that for the P1 cohorts, primary one cohorts, who move on to post-secondary education. In 1995, it uh, was about 60 odd percent. Now it's close to 100%, 97%. So almost every child born will be able to go into post-secondary uh, education. For university graduates, most of them are engineering uh, graduates or they go business and then, uh, and. Uh, and uh, humanities and social sciences, we cover all the other uh, disciplines. And, and so, uh, and you can see again, the increase uh, in the level uh, for all the disciplines. And you may wonder whether, why is it that Singapore is such a small place with uh, such a small birth cohort, and we are able to support all these, uh, so many universities with an increase in enrollment. Uh, this, because uh, we're bringing in a lot of foreign students. I think in LKY school, for example, we have at least 40, 50% of them are uh, foreign students. So bringing in the foreign students is an example uh, of what we do, uh, is how we enlarge our talent base. So for every student that they, uh, um, they come in and study at all levels, uh, we, for the, at the university level, they uh, almost every student has a chance to go overseas, to attend to the overseas university. At the technical level, the Institute of Technical Education has a work study, work study program where all the students are, go out to the enterprise for training. So that these to uh, ensure that they have practical skills. So when they go out in looking for a job in uh, uh, or Building themselves, they already have a skill level, skill base that they can build on. But just and um, doing developing talents uh, and providing training on our own is not enough. We bring in a lot of uh, foreign researchers at the university level. Um, but we also now we just recently we uh, have uh, announced a special tech pass to attract talents. This is the special program to attract founders, leaders, and technical experts with experience for growing, uh, establishing uh, um, fast growing tech companies. So basically those people who are on the tech path, they can come in and out of Singapore with very little restriction. They can do anything they want. They can stay here, they can travel and uh, they can start the business. And so this is in a way is to attract talent and to create this talent ecosystem. In all our research centers, we have already have many different kinds of talent located. But sometimes for somebody out there in the world, they want to come and talk to our people, but they don't want to go through all the hassles of applying for employment pass or arranging for the uh, legitimate uh, legal way to enter and all that. Or, or Singapore is already a very free place for people to enter. Uh, but the, if they want to stay, there are some legal restrictions. So basically, tech task is to remove all these uh, restrictions. So this is part and partial of this whole talent ecosystem. We want to bring the best, the best technical expertise to Singapore. The foundation is the universities, but we want the industries to bring in the, the, the uh, technical, the good people with good skills. And we want these uh, special entrepreneurs who are very good in their special area 
from Rolls Royce to electric cars uh, to Dyson and all that to be able to come in and to create uh, industries in Singapore and also to share the talent uh, with the other people. So that is this uh, e talent ecosystem uh, is very critical to us uh, for the future development. So we also have this uh, thing called the skill future and then uh, this is a really a government propaganda, you know, um, focusing on, you know, you can see from the tagline, your skills, your asset, your future. Basically, the government is fully aware that a person in the Industrial Revolution 4.0 in this new normal economy, we need to constantly upgrade our skills. And uh, so this become, uh, you know, uh, an ideology or, or a, a approach uh, by the Singapore government. So now they are pushing this to in school. The message is that you must learn and we learn all the time. When you start working, we are talking about having a, acquiring new knowledge and prepare for a new career. And then uh, as you, in the old age, we also must learn those new skills and be able to contribute. And then be prepared for career changes. So this skill future is that not only as a matter of philosophy, but the government also put the money to bear. So all of us have a skill future account, the government giving us a lot of money for doing various things. And so uh, this is the kind of uh, approach that Singapore has been uh, doing uh, to promote uh, this uh, human resource. So, uh, um, in terms of uh, transforming Singapore to technology, in terms of skill set, this slide basically shows how we are doing it, creating capability, building partnerships, and various steps. So uh, we can, I can answer more questions uh, later on if you are interested in the Singapore government strategy of how to upgrade the economy uh, through automation, digitization, and then and the intensive skill uh, training. So. With that, I have very briefly mentioned a little bit about um, our competitiveness research on the human resource. And then we talk about the Java situation. And I also I talk about uh, Singapore's experience. So I, this is my final slide. I just want to make a plea to say that we are very happy uh, that uh, we assigned this uh, MOU. Uh, we will be very happy to go into some research collaboration uh, with your university. And then uh, if you can help us to bring more local perspective to our study, we'll be happy. And then we'll be very happy to, uh, to do some joint projects and uh, focusing on uh, Indonesia or the Central Java. So let, let us say that uh, we are completely open to any ideas. I should also mention that in June, we'll be organizing a webinar and then with some of the special economic zones of uh, Indonesia. So they will be providing an update on their progress because all the investors are concerned, are interested to know how COVID-19 has affected uh, the provinces and, and the special economic zones. So we slowly, we were trying to bring uh, these uh, developments uh, through webinar to the larger audience, particularly to Singapore investors. And uh, so this webinar with the special economic zones will be in June uh, this year. So again, uh, we look forward to maintaining our long-standing ties. And then, uh, so thank you again for inviting me. Uh, I hope I have uh, shared some uh, interesting uh, ideas with you. Thank you so much. Professor Paul Chong, yes. I think when we're talking about the competitiveness, it's always interesting and also a lot of parameters exist in terms of the competitiveness. So I think for all participants, you can send the question to through a meeting chat. And then I will try to compile. So we will open up for the first session. This will come for three questions from participants. Please write down on the meeting chat. If you have difficulties to write in English, this will come also to write down in Bahasa. Don't worry. I will try to translate in English. Please.
Maybe Prof. Uh, Professor Paul Chong, maybe I can maybe ask a small question from my side. Is about the job creation and job distraction. Uh, before we read for the question or from participant about the job creation and job distraction, according to your research, especially during a pandemic COVID-19, maybe you can explain to us because we have a lot of insight from your wonderful presentation, please, Professor Chong about a job creation and job destruction. Okay, guys. We Thanks, uh, for your question. I, I'm uh, just looking at the slide, uh, trying to find out uh, the job, uh... job creation. Job creation and job destruction, yes. Mm -hmm. Now we will think for the question from the participant. Uh, I think uh, we have uh, plenty of Sydney here. Yes, of course, we, we can send uh, all the matter presentation to the all participants by the end of uh, this meeting for this uh, wonderful meeting. I couldn't, uh, we didn't really focus on this uh, job creation part. Uh, you said based on the empirical data or you're just asking uh, this uh, general question of job creation? Uh, okay, thank you very much. Yes, yes, it's uh, come up from the meeting chat. Okay, uh, I noticed that the e-commerce business has been developing substantially due to the COVID-19 pandemic. However, our country is still relying on the agricultural business. Would this create a gap in the workforce? If so, how do we close the gap? Yes, there is a question, uh, Prof. Paul Chung, uh, about the e-commerce during pandemic. How we still rely on the agricultural business? So how maybe how to create the, the gap in the workforce, especially for Indonesian? I think, uh, well, it's a clear trend that e-commerce has really blossomed during the COVID-19. I think the e-commerce companies are very happy and, uh, and also a lot of small enterprises, uh, they were able to jump onto the e-commerce platform and start selling a lot of their small products. So we have household enterprises, uh, you know, selling bakery stuff and selling small handicrafts. So there is no limit as to how the e-commerce can expand uh, into different aspects of uh, products and services. So there's no limit why agricultural products could not take advantage of the e-commerce platform. But the trick here is that you need to have a reliable uh, network uh, for e-commerce to take place. The customers need to be able to manage uh, the placing the orders and be able to view the products. And most important of all, the sellers, the platform owners, is able to develop the platform efficiently, be able to handle the logistics of taking the order and making the delivery. So there's a lot of logistic operation elements involved. So the e-commerce companies in Singapore are hiring like crazy. There's a lot of job opportunity in these platforms, in from both software developers uh, to the logistics managers and uh, to the marketing to the coordination people. And so I'm not sure uh, in the universities or in um, in um, the Indonesia whether uh, there are some uh, special trainings uh, for this. But I would say that a lot of these company, recently I just went to visit some of these e-commerce corporations and, uh, and they do a lot of uh, in-house training. But the person is that the, 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 in, the incoming with the recruits must have some basic knowledge. I think the digital preparing the, the, the uh, workers uh, with some digital background and uh, getting them interested and not to be frightened by the digital platform I think that would be a good start. And I think the e-commerce platforms, they can easily provide the necessary in 
job on the job training to do this thing. Thank you, uh, Professor Paul Chung. Yes, thank you for thanks for the question. And for the next uh, question, come from Mr. Fuat. Is the chairman of the Department of Accounting at Faculty of Economics Undip. The question is about the result and objective of RCE. Yes, a competitiveness. Yes, maybe the result and objective of ACI research are redundant with the ones conducted by the local. Yes, local government is here means a local government. And how did you deal with any conflicting findings? So I think this is a really interesting question, Prof. <laughs> how you deal about the redundant may be conducted by the local government <laughs> and co uh, co uh, correlated with the findings from ACI? <laughs> yes. It's a very good question. Uh, yes. How to come up, how to solve the problem? <laughs> <laughs> I would I would say that um, we are ACI. We have no commercial interest. We have no vested interest in in the in coming up with this kind of numbers. So we provide a methodology, and then we provide the findings. So there are many other similar indices out there. And then, uh, and then they some some of them they do a very good job, and then uh, the data are very interesting. So at the end of the day, it's really for the user to decide. We are in the marketplace of ideas. We provide our measurement, our data, and our interpretation. So it's up to the users to decide which one they would believe or trust more. And which one they will use eventually. So we are quite neutral on this. On our side, the key thing for us is to be professional. We will make sure that our methodology will stay neutral to all the political uh, developments uh, in the region. Okay, Prof. Chung. And also the question, maybe this is the last uh, question from the first uh, session about the recommendation from ACI considering this may be very minimalist for the HR quality data maybe for example from the BPS Central Bureau of Statistics from Appindo what is the critical data that how to measure also the strength indicator based on the district or we can, we can also call as a kabupaten based on your model or based on your ACI model about the quality data maybe because uh, the data is really low quality from maybe from the BPS or Apindo or maybe we can also uh, guess as uh, critical data how to find out about the strength indicator in terms of Kabupaten or district? This is the question come from Mr. Bima Hermasto. Uh, that is a very good, a very critical question. Thank you. <laughs> uh, for any methodology, uh, we need good data. <clears throat> I have been working with the BPS for many, many years. I know BPS very well. And uh, so uh, they are uh, many good professionals there and we track the numbers and uh, so we have used as much as possible the macro data from BPS uh, but at the same time uh, we do our own survey in getting perception data from a Pindo uh, members we need to have the subjective element uh, from the Pindo members and, uh, and so that we can make our assessment uh, better, you know, more effective of the subjective elements. But the sub mixing the objective and the objective elements is a little bit complicated. And sometimes we face difficulties in this. Um, so, and also there's a bit of a logistic um, difficulties in doing this uh, survey every year with the Apindo members. So we are hoping that uh, from next year onwards uh, for our um, assessment of the 
competitiveness index for the subnational um, assessment for Indonesia, we want to base entirely on objective macro indicators from BPS and from other government agencies. We will take out the subjective elements in the future because uh, it's a little bit difficult uh, to get good data uh, from Avinto members on a systematic and scientific basis. So we feel that uh, we need to make some adjustments. But at the same time, we want to go in depth to study some of the provinces instead of uh, doing such a broad level comparison. We will still do it, the high level comparison, but we want to provide more depth to, the, to our studies. So we will be focusing on 10 uh, provinces um, in depth, and we will be working with the university in the province uh, to build a partnership uh, to develop this research program to understand the province better. So I hope that this new approach will bring better insights and less reliant uh, on our own surveys and on this uh, uh, sometimes the poor response rates. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Prof. So now we enter to for the next step on the second session. The question come from Diana Tambunan. She asks about the strategy merger and acquisition according to the international company or multinational company in Indonesia that maybe make some company they cut the number of flavor so maybe it will be uh, dangerous for Indonesian worker even for Indonesian company according to the international strategy major and acquisition what do you think prof? Well, uh, one of the, the uh, major concerns uh, for the workers and the workers' union and anybody who supporting workers' rights is that under the, in the new economy, uh, under Industrial Revolution 4.0, with a focus on automation, digitization, and, uh, and all the technology-based economy that the workers will lose out. You know, the use of AI, the use of machine learning, the use of online services. And so this is very, very real. In Singapore, we are looking at it already. And then uh, and in every other major economies in the world, the displacement of worker by technology is a really real threat. So for any MNCs uh, coming into Indonesia, you would want them to bring the technology to Indonesia. But if they do bring the most advanced technology, there will be a loss of jobs. They will not be hiring as many people as before. And the people they hire will be certain uh, category of workers with special skills and special training. So that is the dilemma. On one hand, we want this technological injection into the local economy so that the economy can level up, produce more value-added goods, and bring the technology to the new frontier, bring the industry to the new frontier. But at the same time, we need to deal with the masses. What about those people with no skills? How are they going to take advantage of this new development, the changes in the economy? So this is a real dilemma for the government in its manpower policy. So I think the, the making Indonesia 4.0 is on a good start. They started by providing a broad-based education training program as possible so that everybody is equipped with some element of digital skills with understanding of the new economy, with understanding how to deal with the technology. So that's a good start. 
And then the next level is to provide more intensive, more focused training. And so this is a process. But I must say that this dilemma of bringing in technology on one hand, protecting workers' rights on the other, is a very real and complicated dilemma to deal with. Yes, okay, thank you very much. Okay, once again, thank you very much for the wonderful participation about for all questions. So I think we have still seven for maximum 10 minutes. So according for the new culture, Prof. Mr. Lee Kuan, you state that Indonesia have a laid back culture that basically state, this is my line. If you want something underneath, you should pay me. Will this have an effect? on the stability of the industrial revolution which will necessitate necessitate the implementation of the new culture so according for the new culture i think this is a uh, good things a good point so maybe do you have any opinion for this question from vidya prof <laughs> i i i must say that uh, i don't know indonesian well enough uh, but mr chairman you are from indonesia what do you think of this <laughs> Yes, okay. And also for the next question, maybe we still have maximum two questions and then we, we have a closing ceremony after this one. <laughs> uh, Prof. Song, uh, maybe you already presented about the improving the competitiveness in terms of the human resource in through of uh, good education and maybe let's say excellent education as Singapore has maybe proved already. And the question is about Indonesia in your mind how to accelerate about the quality of education in indonesia maybe you have uh, something strategic issues according to your uh, research or your experience life experience please uh, thank you uh, uh, there's a very big question and uh I know that in the audience, uh, we have many educators. Uh, I'm not sure whether the dean's still there, and then I know uh, all the professors are there. And uh, I think all of you will have some idea about how to improve uh, the educational system uh, in Indonesia. And uh, I wouldn't want to uh, uh, comment more on that, except to just to say that, uh, I have um, taught uh, quite a number of uh, students from Indonesia in LKY school. I found them to be very well trained, multilingual, speak very good English, speak very good um, uh, the national language, and, uh, and very enterprising. So I have, uh, and I was very impressed uh, by, the, by looking at them uh, as a product from the Indonesian education system. So the question here is how do you broaden the base that the quality of the graduates can maintain, can be at that high level? And uh, so I guess uh, this has to go back uh, to each and every university. How do they improve their own uh, educational their curriculum? and how do they improve the, the teaching and, and the training provided. But from my point of view is that from the students I have been in, in contact with from Indonesia, I was very impressed uh, by the kind of a training uh, they have received. I think some of my students are listening in to this particular uh, webinar, so they should be very happy uh, with my comment. Yes, well, thank you for your answer. Okay, thank you for the question, Mr. Suhana. And now the last question come from our alumni, Mr. Elof Chandra from Semarang. It's about the strategy for human resource for the declining market during pandemic. Maybe it is not a redundant question, but it's about the declining markets about the COVID-19 in Indonesia, especially in Indonesia. Maybe you have a uh, different perspective or maybe a special perspective, Prof, please. Well, the COVID-19 is a game changer. Uh, 
uh, is the disruptor and uh, it affected a lot of uh, the global economy. So a lot of people are losing jobs. In Singapore, the government pumped a lot of money into the job market to support the employment so that the employers would not release the staff, will not uh, retrench the staff. But uh, the job market is still very soft. So I think the moment the government withdraw the support, I think there will be a lot more um, uh, retrenchment. But then on the other hand, the economy seems to be picking up. So a lot of people were saying that the recovery phase, we may have already entered the recovery phase. Hong Kong have reported very good GDP growth, a big rebound. Our manufacturing sector is doing very well. And I'm quite sure that some of your manufacturing activities are also doing well. But the consensus is that the recovery will be uneven. Some sectors are better than the others. So for those sectors that are not doing well, the problem, of course, is to how do you stay survive? How do you deal with the existing group of workers that you have? Do you let them go or do you keep them? Or do you stay together until the recovery comes in? So this is a very difficult problem. And I hope the Indonesian government is providing support uh, to the employers so that they can continue to hold on to the staff so that they can ride out this difficult period. But for every disruption is also a challenge. When the, when the recovery comes along and then uh, there will be an expansion of economic activities. So how the company can take advantage of the expansion is an important question. And by that time, everybody will be fighting for new staff, for good staff and staff with new skills. So how do you uh, able to bring in good people during the recovery phase is uh, uh, an interesting issue. You have to be prepared for it. In Singapore, for example, now probably hiring of staff is easier in a very labor shortage environment in the past. But after the COVID-19, when the economy expands again, I think we will face again the intense competition for workers. So that is the Singapore side of the story, that we are always facing a perpetual labor shortage. But in Indonesia, the situation may be a little bit different. So how do you prepare your industry for the recovery and to be able to hire the right staff for the new economy? Uh, that is uh, a question to ponder over. Thank you. Well, okay. Uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Professor Paul Cheng. And also, uh, once again, thank you very much uh, to Professor Andarianto. Uh, Vice Director of Fundib, and also special thanks to Professor Suarnomo, the Dean of Faculty of Economic and Business, Universitas Diponegoro, Vice Dean uh, Mr. Firmansah, PhD, uh, Vice Dean to uh, Mr. Warsito, Dr. Warsito, thank you very much, and also all participants, all chairmen, each department, Department of Accounting, Depart Mr. Fuad, Department of Management, uh, Mr. Harjum, and also Department from Economics, uh, Mr. Sakir, maybe uh, online also. Okay, uh, now we get back to the Master of Ceremony. That I think uh, we all finished this uh, discussion once again. Thank you for your presence, uh, Professor Paul Chung. Maybe we have uh, next time offline meeting in Semarang in Indonesia yes. at the Faculty of Economic and Business, Universitas Diponegoro. Okay, uh, to the master of ceremony, uh, time is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Jaka Aminata. The scientific oration delivered by Professor Paul Chang. Thank you very much, Professor, for the meaningful lecture, and your lecture will be very beneficial for us. Respected audience, we've arrived at the end of the event today. From the deepest of my heart, I do apologize for my mistakes in presenting this event. We truly honored to have you with us in this event, and we hope you have been enjoying yourself at this event so far. 
Thank you so much for your amazing enthusiasm and participation. Let me close the event. And for all audiences, you are allowed to leave the Zoom meeting room. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you. Universitas Diponegoro Kami persilakan untuk one of the berfoto most favorite campuses bersama in Indonesia untuk panitia dan Semarang, Central Bapak Java, Ibu Indonesia. Semarang, the capital and the largest city of Central Java, is known as a My City with slogan The Great Semarang. The city is famous for heritage building. It lies in the northern part of Central Java and it is about an hour flight from Indonesia capital city, Jakarta. Located about 15 minutes from the downtown of Semarang City, Faculty of Economics and Business, Universitas Diponegoro, brings its vision to become a leading faculty of economics and business in the implementation of three pillars of higher education, held at the national and international levels, as well as rooted in the surrounding community. This faculty was established on March 14, 1960. Well, let's have a look inside. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Hi everyone, my name is Professor Soeharno Mo, Dean of Economic and Business Faculty, Universitas Diponegoro. Warm greeting from Semarang, Central Java, Indonesia. Let me inform you a little bit about our faculty. Faculty of Economic and Business is one of the best in Indonesia. We are top five based on world university ranking by subject 2021 made by Time Higher Education. We also offer sport master and doctoral program in management, accounting, and economics. All these programs incorporate the values of local wisdom as part of its curricula. FAB UNIP also has a professional program known as Professional Accounting Program which was established in 2003. All these study programs have been accredited and awarded A category or outstanding category by the National Accreditation Agency for Higher Education, Republic of Indonesia. Internationally, FAB UNIP is accredited by the Alliance on Business Education and Scholarship for Tomorrow, a 21st century organization, ABS 21. With a well-designed curriculum, facilities, and resources, our faculty provides the students knowledge and skills to succeed in national and global business environment. We have so many partners in developing our faculty, such as governments, banking industries, private sector, and also other potential universities, especially from Europe, Asia, and Australia. Currently, we are increasing cooperation with other stakeholders to bring our faculty to be the best choice faculty in Indonesia. Besides its regular study programs, FAB UNDIP also offers International Undergraduate Program to students. The International Undergraduate Program, or IUP, is established to meet the demand of today's international competition. All courses in the International Undergraduate Program are delivered in English, and the curriculum is in par with the top business school standard. The IUP consists of three majors, International Business, Accounting, Economics, and Finance. During the study, students can test their classroom theories and get innovative network through internship, business guest competition, career fairs, and students groups. All IUP students will also experience to become part of the global society through double degree, single degree, and international student exchange program. Double degree program allows students to obtain two undergraduate degrees from UNDIP and partner institution. Since the curriculum in IUP FAB UNDIP is set to the international standard, all credits obtained in UNDIP are transferable to the partner institution and universities worldwide. Partner universities, Sakshon University of Applied Sciences, the Netherlands, University de La Réunion, France, MBS Paris 13, France, University of Applied Sciences and Arts, Northwestern Switzerland, University of Sheffield, England, Curtin University, Australia, the University of Western Australia, the University of Queensland, Australia, University Technology Malaysia, University of Malaya, Malaysia, University Kebangsaan Malaysia, 
Chiba University, Japan, Kagoshima University, Japan, Kanazawa University, Japan, Toyohashi University, Japan, Chungang University, Korea, Kangwon National University, Korea, Asia University, Taiwan, Tunghai University, Taiwan, and etc. The faculty has academic and non-academic facilities to support and optimize the potential of the students, the library, economics, business, and accounting laboratory, and Bloomberg Finance Laboratory are provided for students to help them learn further about their studies. Our faculty is also equipped with adequate facilities such as basement parking area, sport facilities, working space, and green space for students to study. Beside the activities inside the class, we also have activities outside the class. For example, singing or economic voice, sound and dance, theater, study clubs or capital market, English conversation, and so many others. That's some of the things that you can get. So, what are you waiting for? See you at the Faculty of Economics and Business, Universitas Diponegoro. Au revoir. Annyeong. Sayonara. Universitas Diponegoro, UNDIP, as one of the most favorite campuses in Indonesia, is located in Semarang, Central Java. In